Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. Imagine your website has just gone live, and the next thing you know, you're on a radio show. That's exactly what happened to me one week in June 2001. After weeks of hard work and lots of back and forth, my website had gone live. By today's standards, it wasn't a very flashy website. It had tiny fonts and was extremely spartan. But finally, it was up and running. That very afternoon, I was at a store and I ran into the presenters of a popular radio show. They asked me a few questions and then they asked me what I did. At the end of the question set, they announced my website on the air. I was excited beyond belief. I called my webmaster, Chris Parkinson, and I told him to expect loads of traffic. You know what happened next, right? Yes, nothing. No one showed up to the site, despite the popularity of the radio show. My excitement turned to disappointment as the hours ticked by. But what was I expecting? I'll tell you what I was expecting. I was expecting a miracle moment. And I learned that events don't always roll out the way you've planned which is why this series is about the startup stories that we've experienced at Psychotactics. They're a series that gives you an understanding of how we went about our early days, how we didn't just sit behind our computer and hope that clients would sign up. It wasn't just about starting a blog or putting up a website. These are stories that I haven't quite told before. And there are three stories. The first one is about our trip to Australia. The second one about the insurance company speech. And finally, about the boat cruise. Let's start out with the first one, which is the One Person Australian Workshop. In 2004, we did something quite bold. We'd been in business for just a year and eight months when we decided to have a workshop in Los Angeles. That workshop, priced at $1,500 per person, sold out. Which prompted us to have our second workshop closer to home. When a client suggested we have a workshop in Australia, we jumped at the opportunity. And the deal for this workshop seemed almost too good to be true. The client wasn't asking us to do all the promotion. Instead, he was going to get over 60 people to attend our two-day event. And all we needed to do was show up. Workshops are notoriously hard to fill at any point in time. When you start marketing a workshop, you get a few early signups and then it goes deathly quiet for a very long time. Finally, as the date approaches, you get another spurt of sign-up activity, which usually fills up the remaining seats. For this particular workshop, we hadn't got any early sign-ups, and even though that was a worry, we weren't terribly concerned. After all, the client was going to get those 60 people to attend. If just half of them showed up, we'd still have a sizable number of attendees. Even so, an uneasy calm set in. The emails from the client weren't encouraging. 
He kept bringing up stories of local disasters. There was a drought in the area, a big fire in the city, things that seemingly had no bearing on the workshop. When we didn't react to this doom and gloom, he sent us many more emails. The numbers receded from 60 and then suddenly we had 30 to 10. Now it was too late for us to change our minds. We had already committed to the workshop and so we decided to go ahead. When the client realized that we were determined to go ahead, he booked the venue and the accommodation for us. And here's the interesting bit. We just knew that the workshop was in Victoria somewhere and we didn't know where. We assumed that it would be in a big city like Melbourne. So we had the address, but we didn't check it. Imagine our horror when we were driven over 116 kilometers to a little town called Hepburn Springs. We must have been naive at the time anyway, because it never occurred to ask where the workshop was being held. Our workshop in Los Angeles had been so successful that it didn't cross our minds that anything could go wrong. Yet, there we were, with no clue as to what was going on, who was going to turn up, and not even a faint idea about the location of the venue, which is when we got our next shock. The venue was a bed and breakfast with what seemed to be a billiards room. There in the middle of the room was, as you would expect, a billiards table. And I was somehow supposed to present with that monstrosity right in the room. I asked if the table could be moved. The owner grinned and said, That table hasn't moved in a hundred years, mate. It's not going to move now. The only option we had was to put a big sheet over the table and chairs around it as if it were a conference table of some kind. But the surprises didn't stop at the venue and the table. On the day of the event, two people turned up. The client and his non-paying friend called Margaret. Nonetheless, we were there to do a workshop and if one person turned up, the workshop would go ahead. As we always do, we started on time at 8.32 a.m. Then, at 8.45 a.m., the doors burst open and another participant showed up. Yes, it was our first paid participant. And she'd seen the announcement of the workshop in our email newsletter and decided to come along. It seemed like we were going to recover some of our costs after all. However, this paying participant was no ordinary participant. She happened to be the general manager of a $500 million company that was located in Melbourne. In the break, she spoke to me and was surprised at the lack of attendees, but she also expressed her admiration. I was amazed that with just two people in the room, you started right on time. Over the next two days, we went through the elements of the Brain Audit Workshop and by the end of the workshop, we had a bit of a reward. That general manager wanted us to come and present to her company while we were still in Victoria, and she was willing to pay us for the trouble. And so, we broke even. We could have given up at that stage when the client was sending all those depressing email reports, but instead we decided to persevere, and yes, we had a happy ending. But what are the lessons? There were three lessons here. The first lesson is that duds are part of the game. The reason I'm relating this story to you is because I see so many people today who want to start up a business, but they want to be successful in a very short time, and preferably with no downsides. If you're starting up a business today, how many duds are you willing to embrace? The biggest reason why I see businesses failing is because they don't want to fail. They play safe. They want clients to come to them via a blog or a website. They don't want to go out on a limb and fail a bit. Failing isn't a nice feeling, but it teaches you a great lesson. 
and sometimes, like we did, you get lucky. That takes us to lesson number two, which is cover your costs. We bought our plane tickets, we paid for the venue before we had good enough information. Since then, whenever we've had a workshop, we make a temporary booking of the venue. Until we can sign up at least a few clients, we don't book or buy anything. We've never made a loss on an event, but we came very close to making a loss with this Hepburn workshop. It taught us to pre-sell and then to commit to an event. We use the same concept for our product launches. We pre-sell and only once we have signups do we create the product. And there's a third lesson, work your own contacts. When we started out, we didn't have much of a list. We built that list through writing really good articles, not your run of the mill articles, but insightful, funny articles. Despite the presence of a list, we didn't have many names from Australia. And we decided to work with the client who'd promised to get us 60 participants. Now, that was obviously a mistake. When you give away that much of control, you don't know for sure how things are going to work out. In the end, we had no control over that venue, the participants, and were stuck with a billiards table in the middle of the room. So we learned a lot in those early days from just a single workshop. But that trip to Australia, was only one of our early adventures. The second adventure was definitely the insurance company speech. I don't remember how I got some of the early speaking assignments, or maybe I'm just trying to forget. This early assignment was in Wellington, where I was supposed to speak to a large number of insurance agents. The presentation was about the brain audit, but I tried valiantly to get case studies about the insurance business. I met with the client many times at their local office. I did my research and found many examples about the insurance industry. And that's where I made my first mistake. Well, anyway, I flew to Wellington and started my presentation. As I got through the first 15 minutes or so, I realized that the audience was not reacting the way I expected them to do so. Instead of being interested in the case studies, they seemed to be bringing up objections and interrupting my presentation. And rightly so. I was the outsider in the room. I didn't know squat about insurance and the insurance industry. And there I was, giving them case studies that left me open to attack. That's when my second mistake became apparent. I was still very much a rookie at presenting, so I took whatever advice I could get in that field. And one presenter told me to never use slides. He suggested that slides were like the kiss of death. As it turned out, slides would have saved me from going to pieces on that particular day. As the audience grew restless, I grew extremely nervous on stage. And then, someone walked out. Who knows why they walked out? Maybe it was just to go to the toilet or maybe to get a drink. But as my eye moved towards the exit, I could see the entire audience walking out in droves. And though no one else was walking out at that point, I couldn't focus and I forgot what I had to say next. If I had slides, I could have used them as a guide and moved along. Maybe the presentation would have still been a disaster, but it would have been a lot better than a professional presenter, that's me, standing on the stage with his mouth open and his mind blank. I still had 20 minutes to go and nothing came to mind. I had no slides. And so I left the stage, went down the corridor and locked myself in the room until the taxi came to pick me up to the airport much later. But that's not the end of the story. Three years later, I was asked to speak at quite a different event, but at the very same venue on the very same stage. 
To say I was mortified was putting it lightly. I could see myself forgetting what I had to say and fleeing for the second time in a row. You know how it is when you're all wound up, don't you? You don't sleep very well at night. And that night I counted every single police or ambulance siren that roared by on the street. However, this time my presentation was different. This time I was not going to make the same mistakes. I had learned from the mistakes last time. The first mistake I had made was trying to appeal to the audience. When you try to appeal to an audience of people in your industry, you at least have some authority to do so. But when you're facing an audience from another industry, it's like walking into a trap. And I had had one experience and that was enough. I presented my information, just the brain audit presentation, and left the audience to their own conclusion. And they loved it. So I was over that mistake. And then the second mistake that I'd made was to speak without slides. It may sound like a good idea not to speak with slides, but if you've spent the entire night counting sirens, you're likely to be tired and prone to mistakes. After that event, I never left home without my slides. Whether it's a psychotactics workshop or any presentation, I will use slides. I also take a backup on an external drive. I'll print out a sheet of the main points just in case technology fails me at the last minute. But easily the biggest experience to draw upon was walking back on that stage. It was scary, but I realized that if I backed out, I would always fear that venue and that stage. The venue wasn't the problem. It was the way that I handled my presentation that caused all the problem. Going back into that seeming danger zone made me more resilient than ever before. So we looked at the first story and it was about that one person presentation in Australia. And then we looked at this scary story about Wellington. And for some reason, I seem to have picked a third story and it's about presentations as well. But this one is not on land. It's the bouncy boat cruise. I'm not a big fan of believing in the universe. I believe that you need to put in the effort and you get the result. And yet, I couldn't explain how I ended up on this cruise from New Zealand to Australia. At the start of the year, I'd written my goals, and one of the goals was to get on a cruise ship. But as I plowed through the year, there was no cruise ship with my name on it. Then in May, I had a meeting with the CEO of a bed franchise. I'd like you to make a presentation at our annual event, he said when I met him at his office. You know what's coming next, don't you? Yes, the annual event wasn't a cruise ship. As excited as I was about the universe pitching in, I still had a job to do. And the presentation wasn't bothering me too much because I had just made similar presentations in the months running up to the cruise. The first night as we sailed away, there were incredibly calm seas. But calm seas and the Tasman don't go together, especially in June. June is the start of winter in this part of the world, and winter brings stormy seas. Added to that, the Tasman Sea is considered to be one of the roughest stretches of water. But we were in a good mood, and when we woke up next day, we had bacon and eggs for breakfast. Oily bacon and buttery eggs. And then all hell broke loose. The ship started bouncing about like crazy. When I say bouncing about like crazy, I really mean bouncing about like crazy. It was bouncing so much that if you got into the swimming pool, it was like committing suicide. The water was sloshing from one side to the other. And then the bacon and egg started to work its way out. Now. Under normal conditions, you shouldn't be eating oily stuff, but on the rough sea, it's pure madness. 
Renuka and I were not only seasick, we were throwing up for a solid hour. And later that morning, I had to make my presentation. Somehow, Renuka staggered to the medical center to buy some overpriced pills to stop or at least reduce that seasickness. And then it was showtime. Luckily, the presentation was in the lower part of the liner, which happened to be the most stable. But I was feeling terrible and I had a hard time standing up. So I didn't get on the stage. Instead, I made the presentation from the bottom of the stage at seat level. I even held the stage for support. 45 minutes later, I was done and the CEO came up to continue the proceedings. You didn't look too well, he said to me as we passed. Did you drink a little too much last night? Now, the CEO had sponsored the evening and drinks were free, so everyone was drinking. But I didn't drink. And the reason I didn't drink was because Renuka told me not to. She said, let everyone drink. You're going to drink water and you're going to make a big show of drinking water. And that's what I did. And when you think about it the next day, you're throwing up and you're feeling sick. Well, what is the CEO going to think? He's going to think you spent the night drinking. Luckily for me, Renuka was around to make sure I didn't have a drink. And that played a big role. So what we are looking at here is a concept of perception. Often you judge not by what you can do, but other people's perception of you. If I had been drinking the previous night, it wouldn't have mattered that I was seasick. It wouldn't have mattered that I made a wrong choice at breakfast time with bacon and eggs. My pale demeanor would have been attributed to the fact that I had been drinking and I wasn't a professional. And I found this to be true not just with speaking engagements, but in every area of my life. When there's a course on, I don't tell my clients what's happening in the background. If I have a workshop, I focus on the slides, the presentation, and how everything goes, and not about any other issues. When you let your audience know that you have other issues, and we all do have other issues, they automatically attribute some slip up to that issue, even though that issue may not be connected in any way. So that was the learning. The learning was that perception was everything, and of course, that you shouldn't be drinking before an important event. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. Often in life, we're waiting for that miracle moment. We're sure that if we simply put up the website or we start writing that blog, things will happen. What I found is different. With the Australia One Person Workshop, we found that persistence paid off, but this was less of a story of persistence and more about learning how groundwork and preparation can avoid failure. We still need to get out from our office. We still need to push ourselves into the unknown, but we can do so without taking nutty risks. The Wellington presentation story was one of facing your demons and conquering them. Once I found that I could win that battle against fear, I felt comfortable taking on scary situations time and time again. Finally, the boat cruise could have gone horribly wrong. If Renuka wasn't around to give me advice, then perception would have taken over. Perception is far greater than reality, and I've learned over the years to manage perception because what people believe is what they feel to be true. No one is saying that you need to be fake. No one is saying that you have to feed your audience with what you think they should hear. I openly share what we do, where we've succeeded and where we've failed. But in the middle of an assignment, in the middle of a presentation, in the middle of something, you need to focus on the assignment and keep any additional stories for later, much later, like I'm doing at this podcast, much, much later. And that's it. Three stories, 
from the Psychotactics Vault. What else is happening in Psychotactics land? Well, two things actually. The first thing is the Da Vinci cartooning course. It's starting on the 22nd of August, but we're going to start selling it long before that. So you have to be on the Psychotactics list to get the notification. There are very limited seats, about 30 or so, and that's it. We close at that point. The second one is the headlines course, which starts on the 6th of September. Again, you have to be on the Psychotactics list. So if you haven't signed up, go to the Psychotactics website and sign up to the list. And yes, 5000 BC members get first preference for everything. And if you're a member of 5000 BC, then obviously you get in before everybody else. So that's me from Psychotactics land. Bye for now.